And uh, I'd like to speak to you today on the subject of Jesus, the great physician. So just let me share my screen with you. And let's just reflect on this subject for a few moments together. Uh, you'll, you'll no doubt have seen uh, numerous news articles over the last few months and uh, nearly a year now, isn't it, that we've had this pandemic uh, that's affected everyone across the whole world. And we've seen, haven't we, the great challenges that it's brought upon so many men and women in terms of their health. And what we're starting to see is that the challenges to people's health is, is beyond the pandemic itself, but actually in terms of people's mental health. In fact, um, some research is being done at the moment by many institutions, but this particular research that I'd like to draw your attention to from uh, the Mental Health Charity Foundation has been completed by the University of Swansea. So I thought it would be of interest to us um, living uh, just outside of Swansea to, to use this research. It's been done by, as I say, the University of Swansea and the University of Cambridge um, and, and a couple of other major institutions too. And what they're finding out, we're not surprised to see, is that the key indicators of distress among adults in the United Kingdom, which include loneliness, uh, feelings of suicide, not coping well with stress, are now worse, considerably worse, than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the, the research has been carried out by um, uh, four and a half thousand adults who have been contacted. Um, the researchers looked at um, waves um, starting from the beginning of the pandemic right the way through to the end of November, and it will carry on um, into 2021. And, and what that final statement uh, shows us um, there is that the extent of loneliness has risen from 10% of UK adults to now 25% of those surveyed. Now, that's an extraordinary statistic, isn't it? You think of uh, 10 people, one in 10, um, who were feeling loneliness at the beginning of pandemic. We're now at a situation where we're, we're talking, aren't we, about five in 20 adults who are beginning to feel lonely. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Now, when we just look at some graphs from uh, these organizations we can see that people are really struggling the levels of people coping very or fairly well with stress related to the pandemic at the beginning well about three quarters of the population were doing okay now over a third of the population is struggling significantly they're not coping well or or even fairly well with the stress related to the pandemic. A statistic like this is really worrying. We're seeing the, uh, the, the graph going up of people who, within the last two weeks, have experienced some form of suicidal thoughts. These are worrying statistics. Now 13% of UK adults within the last two weeks have saying, are saying that they're experiencing some form of suicidal thought. And in amongst all of this, we've seen already that statistic regarding uh, the loneliness that people are feeling within the UK, how that's just going up. But we're also seeing that people feel a sense of hopelessness. And you might say, well, what is to be done? What's the solution? And it's fair to say that it's not easy, is it? We look around and we can't think that the scientists have got all the answers. One scientist says this, another scientist says that. One politician says this, another politician says that. Lots of well-meaning people are doing their very best. But we're living in a world that's in real crisis. And it's affecting families and it's affecting individuals. And so what we as Christadelphians in Mumbles and Christadelphians across the world are imploring are asking any 
individual, but certainly those who may be feeling lonely or hopeless or struggling with stress or at worse, feeling almost suicidal, like they, they, they don't want life to go on. Our suggestion to you is very simple. In fact, it's in front of me. It's to open up your Bible. You might say, well, come on, the Bible, you know, written thousands of years ago. What help is that in a 21st century pandemic? Well, when uh, the Apostle Paul, you may have heard of, um, uh, a man living in the first century, wrote to the Ecclesia, not in Mumbles, but the one in Rome, he said to them, and they were going through incredible trials themselves. The, the Caesars of the time were exceptionally difficult. So they were living in a city which naturally was governed by uh, Caesar. You think of Caesars like Nero, um, who would burn Christians at the stake. He, he would crucify them. Um, the most terrible barbaric things were done to Christians. We think of uh, the gladiators and the um the, the the trials that christians were put through and yet when the apostle paul writes them he says listen open your bibles now he's telling them to open their bibles to texts that were written thousands of years before their time all right so our suggestion is no different to what the apostle paul was inspired to write to the ecclesias in rome and to others too and look what he says he says the things that were written aforetime, in other words, the things that were written before, in, the things written in the Old Testament, he says, they weren't written for anything. They were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So we're going to need some patience, right? We're certainly going to need patience at this time. But the scriptures are able to provide us with comfort, ultimately, that we might have hope. So that sense of hopelessness, of loneliness, that feeling that so many have got of anxiety and stress, because the pressures from the pandemic and beyond in our lives, the Bible, the scriptures, are able to give us hope. So let me share with you, if I may, one of the stories from the Bible, uh, one of the, um, uh, the, the records given to us that perhaps show to us why the Bible can give us hope. Let me take you to the book of numbers now the book of numbers is right at the beginning of your bible the, the bible begins with five books called the the books of the law the books of moses and uh they are genesis exodus leviticus numbers and deuteronomy so i want you if you've got a bible to open your bible to numbers chapter 21 And in Numbers chapter 21, we read a story regarding the children of Israel, which is a name used to describe the Jewish people, the ancient Jewish people who left Egypt as slaves and were taken through a desert, through a real trial in a wilderness, before they were going to get to the promised land. But they were given strict instructions as how they should live uh, at that time before they would be given the blessings of the promised land. And tragically, many of them complained, they murmured, they moaned, and they had to learn that the problem of suffering was related to sin. In fact, sin is the beginning of suffering. And so the result of their sin in their complaining, their murmuring, their unwilling to accept what God had given to them. We read in verse six of Numbers 21 that the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. And so the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. And of course, that's exactly what they've done. And they, so they're doing the right thing, acknowledging their sin. Pray to the Lord that he takes away these serpents from us. 
So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. It shall come to pass that everyone that's bitten when he looks on it shall live. Now we might think, well, what on earth? Would God ask Moses to, to, to make a serpent and put this fiery serpent on a pole so that everyone who looks at it would, would live? And, and, and if you're a man or woman in Israel that's been bitten by these snakes that have come through the camp, the last thing you're going to want to do is look up at a serpent on a pole and live. Well, you want to live, but you're not going to necessarily want to look up at a serpent on a pole. But here's the point, you see. What was being illustrated or demonstrated in this story is that the people of Israel had to recognize the problem of sin, that sin brings suffering. And the, the, the serpent, of course, you, many of you will know the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The serpent is used then through scripture to symbolize sin. So you brought suffering into the world the problem of sin is suffering right so what's this about well you see the fact that the serpent had to be held up the people had to acknowledge their sin and in looking up when they were in terrible pain perhaps some of them with poison coursing through their veins They'd have to have faith to get out of their tent doors in the wilderness and to look up at that pole lifted high with a serpent on it, knowing that if they did look at that, then they would be able to live. And so we're told in verse nine that Moses made a servant of brass, put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a servant had bitten any man, when he beheld the servant of brass, when he looked at it, he lived. And so this story is going to point forward to something altogether more marvellous. Don't forget that what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans was the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. So what does this point forward to? Something being lifted high that the people might need to look at in order that they also could live and it was for look verse eight everyone that had been bitten well it points forward to the work of the lord jesus christ the one who was going to do away with the problem of sin and its consequences that is suffering and ultimately death now just before or as you're turning to john chapter three do you recognize that picture there on the screen of the serpent on the pole? You probably do. You probably got it in your subconscious somewhere because that picture is used the world over by healthcare trusts um, and surgeries as the emblem of the physician. It's been used as that emblem by the world. And isn't that amazing? You, 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 now you might say, oh, yes, I, I recognize that from this particular healthcare trust or from this particular website that's to do with health. Now you know where it's from. It's from Numbers chapter 21, where the people had to have the faith to look up at that serpent on the pole that they might live. Now, if you're in John chapter three, so John is in the New Testament now. The things that were written aforetime, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, were written for our learning. Now look what it says in John chapter 3. You'll know these words well from verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, remember what it said in Numbers 21, that everyone that's bitten when he looks at it shall live. Here it says that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now you might say, well, how is this connected to the serpent on the pole? Just go back a couple of verses to verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So do you see that one of those stories written in the Old Testament 
was pointing forward to what the work of the Lord Jesus would be, the one who would deal with the problem of sin. You don't need to turn there. But you see, in Genesis chapter 3, when sin came into the world, God said to the serpent that he would send someone to stamp on the head of sin, of the serpent. And that's what the Lord Jesus does. He was the one that dealt with that problem. The, the snakes, if you like, have bitten us all. All of us, to a greater or lesser extent, are suffering. And that suffering, the root problem of it, the cause of it, is the problem of sin that's in the world. And so that's why the Bible is able to give hope in this hopeless world. That's why Christadelphians, even during this pandemic, despite the fact that we also have lost loved ones who've fallen asleep, who've died because of this pandemic. For us, this isn't the end of the world. Because we believe what the Bible teaches, that Jesus Christ was sent into the world by God because he so loved the world that anyone that was prepared to put their faith in him, in this word, would ultimately be able to live. And so though I've got a lovely neighbour, a Christadelphian who's sadly died, I'm not downhearted, although I can't pretend I don't feel sad for that situation. I also am filled with hope because I believe that he, like Jesus, will be raised from the dead. And, you know, you might say, well, who's this for? Well, it clearly tells us it's for everyone. But I just want you to take... I want to take you back to the Gospel of Luke. You're in John. Just go back to the previous Gospel, and that is Luke. I just want to show you what the Lord Jesus said to a group of people who thought that he was behaving inappropriately by the fact that he was willing to go into the house of someone who was a sinner. And so the, the leaders of the day said to the disciples of the Lord Jesus, in verse 30 of Luke chapter 5. Why do you, why, do you, why does Jesus and, and you, you disciples, why are you eating and drinking with publicans and sinners? And Jesus didn't wait for the disciples to answer. He turned to them and said, they that are whole, well, they don't need a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And here's the point. Well, all of us are sinners, but are you prepared to acknowledge it? In addition, you might think, well, I'm doing just fine. I'm not in one of those with the statistics that you showed us on the screen, Pete. I know I'm all right. I'm, I'm coping fine in all this. Well, if you don't want to open your Bible, no one's going to force you. But if you are one of those people that, feels like you're really suffering, that you're full of anxiety and worry at this time, that you do feel lonely, you feel hopeless, that you perhaps are amongst those who just feel like giving up. Is it even worth living? Well, it is. Because we've got something marvellous to live for. If you feel all right, well, don't worry. But if you're amongst those who are feeling sad and downcast and anxious and stressed, well, the Lord Jesus wants to come to your house. He'll come into your house if you open up this word and read about him and the plan and purpose that God has with this world, that God has sorted 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus died for the world. The problem of sin and suffering has been sorted. We're now waiting for the Lord Jesus to come back to the earth, which is what the Bible teaches us will happen. 
to change this world, to deal with the problems, the problems this pandemic has brought and others too, and to set up a world in which there will be no more suffering. Just come to the last book of the Bible, to Revelation chapter 21, where we read of that time in verse 4, when God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. There won't be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That offer of salvation given to the children of Israel in the wilderness was for everyone. But only those who had the faith to go out of their tents, to look up at that serpent on the pole, only they were able to live. And so our challenge to you is, have you got the faith to open up your Bible, to look up, as it were, at the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was put up on the cross. Have you got the faith to look at that? If you have, and you're prepared to open your Bible, then you too can share the wonderful blessing and hope that we have and live. Do you know when the Apostle Paul was on death row in Rome, he was going through terrible suffering, worse than anything you and I are going through. He was in the most appalling dungeon below Rome. And he wrote to his young friend, Timothy. And he said to Timothy, hold fast the form of sound words which you've had from me. Do you know that word sound is the same Greek word as the word whole that the Lord Jesus used when he spoke to the scribes and the Pharisees in that house. And so, you see, this word that the Apostle Paul exhorts Timothy to hold on to is not just any word. It's able to make you wise to, to save you, we're told. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote later to Timothy. And so he's saying, hold fast to it. And so our exhortation, if you like, our call, our cry to you, Get your Bible off the shelf, dust it down, hold fast to it. In it is a form of whole or healthy words, which if you are prepared to read in faith and in love, then you will be given the most wonderful blessings. And so let me finish there, but let me also... Uh, suggest to you that you um, follow some of the links or the, the, the hashtags of the screen that will shortly follow. And uh, if you need any support in opening that word, then know that as Christadelphians, we would be delighted to, to be that support for you, to help you out and to, to get you reading the salvation contained in the word of God. Thank you for listening.